It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here. There's a crowded room. Um, we are about to start uh, the week, so having a lot of people on Monday is always a good sign. Uh, thank you for participating. Um, on behalf of, of the WIN, the Water Integrity Network, I would like to um, thank all our co-conveners and partners who made this event possible. First of all, um, uh, Shirley Thomson Reuters, uh, Helvetas, um, uh, also the WASH Network for West Africa, uh, the WASH uh, Journalist Network. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here because um, we do think that uh, not only is an interesting topic, but as a, there's room for and space for um, talking about a more collaborative way of operating and and uh, um, and acting in the field between uh, uh, NGOs and, and journalists. But let me just uh, skip the introduction to uh, introduce the, our main um, guest moderator, Fred Pierce, uh, if you want to join me in uh, applause. <laughs> Fred, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Yes, my job is to moderate and uh, generally keep quiet as much as possible, but just to keep, keep the show on the road. Uh, my, yes, my name is Fred Pierce. I'm an environment journalist, uh, freelance journalist, new scientist, and a lot of other people over the years. Um, we're here, I think, to discuss what was called yesterday naming and shaming. That is what journalists do, to discuss, perhaps more politely, how journalists can promote water integrity, this, this horrible phrase that we're a bit stuck with. Um, I think what water integrity means, it's, it's sort of bureaucrat speak for addressing real issues that journalists write a lot about, about corruption, about unfairness, and about abuse of power within the water industry. And I think many of us will know that the water industry is quite vulnerable to these abuses. Uh, it often involves Big contracts, billion-dollar contracts sometimes for building major dams and other big infrastructure projects about which how these uh, uh, contracts are awarded is sometimes pretty opaque. Big prospect for corruption there. They involve monopolistic management, whether in public or private hands, a, a lack of transparency very often. Natural open markets, which people can have confidence in a pretty difficult to arrange inside a naturally kind of monopolistic kind of industry. That's inevitable to the nature of the industry, providing a basic infrastructure services, but it creates real problems of accountability and integrity. Um, so I think we have a lot to talk about. I would be quite interested in knowing who's here. Um, I guess there are sort of three categories of people. Perhaps there are working journalists, media professionals, and perhaps, without wishing to demean you, others. I'd be really interested to see hands held up to see who falls into which category. So how many people here would regard yourself as a working journalist? Excellent, that's good to see. How many would regard yourself as kind of media professionals? Ah, fewer than I thought. Um, and how many come in the other category? <laughs> Excellent. Large numbers of people, wide open to corruption, I'm sure. Um, uh, okay, what with the structure of the meeting is we're going to have three presentations um, of about 15 minutes, and I'll try and keep them to, to 15 minutes, from people kind of at the workplace, I suppose you'd say, in, in one form or another um, in, in, inside the media industry. Um, they will speak for 15 minutes. We'll then have a brief period for Q&A, and then we'll have a panel of four other people um, from uh, broadly the NGO sector, I guess, who are going to, I hope, respond to those presentations, perhaps, um, perhaps sharply, perhaps uh, affirmatively, I don't know. And then to break into a wider discussion about how we go about, well, naming and shaming for sure, but also encouraging integrity in water and perhaps more generally with um, the thought of how the media in general can do that. So first up, to talk about um, 
Kibera's water mafia, so we're talking about the water mafia in the, the slums of Nairobi in Kenya. And from the Thompson's Reuters Foundation, we're going to hear from Magdalena Miss, if I have that right. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Magda Mess, and I am a journalist with the Thomson Reuters Foundation in London. Um, thank you, Fred, for the introduction. And I, I do agree that uh, it is a role of the journalist to name and shame and also to bring uh, into light some issues that sometimes uh, we don't know about, even as journalists. Sometimes we don't know what's going on in uh, different places, and we often do rely on NGOs to tell us that there is an issue somewhere and based on those, the, the information that we receive, we can investigate and look into uh, issues that are happening around the world. I'll be talking about a story I did last year with my uh, colleague uh, and journalist, uh, Katie Miguero, uh, who is based in Nairobi. And uh, we did a story about Kibera water mafias. So how, how did we start. Uh, I was having a conversation with uh, Harry Bergkamp from the International Water Association. Some of you might know him. So we were having a conversation in our office in London and Harry mentioned that there are a lot of issues around water mafia in slums around the world, including uh, Kibera in Nairobi. And I thought that's an interesting thing. Whenever you hear mafia, it's like uh, there is something that uh, that's interesting. So uh, I spoke to him a little bit more about it. He told me what he knew, that uh, very basically there is a mafia running water supply to people in, uh, in Kibera. And the people who are obviously, as you probably all know, uh, mostly affected by that are women. Because in developing countries, it's often women, most of the time is women who are responsible for supplying water to their families, and they often have to go long distances or queue and carry uh, uh, water containers back home. So uh, it looked like what's happening in Kibera was that uh, because of mafia, those women were suffering because not only they had to spend a lot of money on uh, up to a third of their income on water, but uh, because it seemed like nobody really cared or couldn't uh, provide water to Kibera, they had no other choice but to rely on the mafia. So what we did, I, I, I spoke to Katie in Nairobi, and uh, we decided to look into that story a little bit more. And how we did it, we, uh, I spoke to another NGO, which is Water and Sanitation for the Urban Poor, who is working in Nairobi. Uh, I did speak to her a little bit more about the issue. Uh, I spoke to you and Habitat, who used to work in, uh, in Kibera and knows the situation very well. And uh, Katie, what Katie did in Nairobi, because I'm based in London, so what she did in Nairobi is that she, uh, I think I should change the slide. Uh, so what she did, she went to the slum and spoke to women who are affected by that. And she also spoke to Nairobi Water to see what the situation is like from, uh, from their point of view. Um, so what we looked at is, where does the water really come from uh, in Kibera? And a lot of that water is coming from the water mafia. Uh, the water utility, uh, Nairobi Water was saying that they have a lot of issues with illegal connections. The water is being stolen by the mafia and sold at uh, very high prices uh, back to the women. Uh, so I think one main thing from, from, from uh, this introduction is that when you are doing any kind of investigative story, you need to look and speak to as many people as you think are relevant to that story. So relying, relying on one source is not really enough. So especially when you're talking about uh, people affected and uh, you're may perhaps accusing a government or water utility or whoever, you need to speak to these people as well to get their side uh, of their story. And how, how to get it right? I mean, Corruption is often based on some sort of accusations where somebody is saying that somebody else is doing something and it's wrong. So um, 
as I said, you need to get all sides of the story. So we spoke to Nairobi Water, we spoke to women in the slum, uh, we got comments from NGOs working in Islam who said that sometimes whenever they build a, a water kiosk to sell water for uh, lower prices, the water mafia, these people sometimes just come and destroy those kiosks because uh, they see NGOs as the competition. Uh, we did not speak to water mafia people because they obviously are very difficult to pinpoint and they don't want to talk. Um, so... Another, another uh, thing to look at is also to put it in broader perspective. Is it just Nairobi or is it happening uh, more broadly around the, around the world in other, uh, in other slums? Uh, the problems, access to data, sometimes you may find out that the utilities or, or Nairobi, uh, in that case Nairobi Water, may not want to release information. We were lucky because they did. Uh, but I was... Uh, two weeks ago, I was in uh, Zambia, and I was talking to Lusaka Water for a story that will be published uh, next month. And there are some issues with data. You may find out that data is not released, or you don't get in as much data as you want, uh, and that, that is often an issue. Um, the language barrier, I mean, if you go to uh, places like I was in Zambia, you need a translator sometimes, and the, the problem with a translator is that sometimes you hear people telling a story in five minutes, and the translator says, yeah, she said they have problems with that. So obviously, you need to make sure that you have a translator that's, that's a good translator and doesn't just tell you his version of the story. Um, also, uh, one thing to remember that... Uh, we are trying to avoid very much is the jargon, and that's an issue I think uh, that can be very dangerous. I got an award once uh, when I started uh, uh, covering water. I got an award for the worst headline because I put wash in the headline, and nobody had, people just have no idea what wash is. Um, so, so be careful of jargon. People start, stop listening to you, stop reading, and they, uh, they just switch off. So um, I work for Thomson Reuters Foundation, which is a charitable arm of Thomson Reuters, and we cover underreported stories um, that mainstream media often don't cover. And we apply uh, journalism rules that uh, Reuters itself applies. So what does it mean for us? And I, I believe personally that uh, this is very important how um, journalism should uh, look like in a way uh, that I think those rules are very important and could be applied by anyone. So first thing is the freedom from bias. Uh, obviously you're telling a story from all points of view. You're not just saying somebody told me that there is corruption going on somewhere and you're just relying on one source. So you can't just put, show one side of the story, you have to show all sides of the story. Uh, another uh, rule that we have is don't put your own voice in a story. I think this is bad because that, that's more for a blog than an investigative story. Um, I said before, give all parties voice and let them comment. If, sometimes people don't want to comment, but if you ask them, give them enough time. If they don't want to comment, then we basically say uh, they refuse to comment. Uh, ask questions, try to find as many sources that you have. The so what is, what's really happening? Who are the people affected? What's the, why, why is it bad, the situation that you're describing? Uh, another another uh, of our rules is that uh, we do not give any gifts, we don't pay for stories, and we don't do any favors uh, to let us uh, remain independent. Uh, protect your sources if um, that's a tricky one because we need to uh, reveal all the names we can't just say anonymous source however if somebody asks you where you have the information the initial information that may be very sensitive we do protect our sources uh, we don't do undercover journalism so we don't go uh, quietly asking people things and then uh, publishing them pretending that we are just passing by uh, that is, uh, that's the uh, first version. Get the names right, obviously, in the story. Make sure that you have all the names uh, right. Um, I think that's it from me. Thank you.
Uh, Magda, let me just ask you one question. Um, when you're identifying who the uh, kind of who the guilty people are, um, I don't know how much attention do you have to give to that. I mean, it occurs to me that in the story that you're telling that maybe the the real guilty people here are the are, are the, the, the 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 water company, the water authority, mm -hmm. in Ket who are not supplying the water mm -hmm. to the slum, rather than the water mafia. Right. Um, so I, I, I wonder how you play when the, you know it's quite quite complex environment. Uh, yes, I don't want to uh, give you too many details. You can read that story uh, <laughs> online. Uh, but basically, uh, in, in case of that story, uh, when we started talking to people, it turned out that the people from the slum were accusing the water utility of being corrupt and not having an interest in providing water for the slum. Uh, so we asked Nairobi Water about that, and mm. they said, well, if we find that somebody is corrupt, we, we deal with them, which you just, that's all you can do. You can ask them and get a comment. Uh, but what I also learned from, I think it was uh, Graham Alabaster from uh, UN Habitat who said that oftentimes, because uh, in case of uh, Kibera, it's built on government land, so people who own uh, those little houses that, that, that uh, the slum residents live in, uh, those little houses are often owned by people who he called are high in the Nairobi society. So they have no interest in dealing with the issue. They just like to keep it as it is. So, mm -hmm. so we were trying to look where the issue is. So one is the water mafia. Number two, nobody seems to have interest in, in, in dealing with that problem. Uh, number three, people were accusing Nairobi Water. Nairobi Water response was, well, we are trying to deal with that, but it's difficult. The, the, the mafia just mushrooms all the time. Okay, great. Thank you very much. You. Um, okay, we're in good time. Um, I'm, we're going to move on now to uh, Yogesh Pant from Helvetas, the, uh, the NGO in Nepal, um, who's going to talk about, I guess, working uh, with the media in promoting integrity. And with a bit of luck, I will be able to find the right... Uh... Yeah, there we are. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Fred. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Good afternoon. I have a small presentation on our experience working with the media to promote water integrity in was sector in Nepal. I have used this abbreviation was water sanitation and hygiene, and I will be frequently using this abbreviation throughout my presentation. <coughs> Uh, actually, uh, Fred, you have already done a survey that how many journalists are there. And also I raised my hand among the others category and I am not a journalist. So definitely you will not get a journalist perspective in my presentation. This is simply a, the sharing of our experience. And I hope many of you where Nepal is, this is located. Uh, in South Asia, in between India and China. And you can see in this map, the country is landlocked. A small country has got land area of about one, uh, 147,000 square kilometer and population 26.5 million. And from this data in the right hand side of this slide, you can make out that the country is developing one, a poor one. Uh, about 70% of its population they depend on the agriculture sector, and the country heavily depends on remittances. Most of our young people, they migrate to the Gulf countries, to India, and to many other countries in search of employment, and they send back uh, money in the form of remittance. And the good part about Nepal, this is the country of Mount Everest, the highest peak on the earth. Uh, I hope you know that. Uh, just for your information, out of the 10 highest peak mountains on the earth, eight are in Nepal. And the country is also the birthplace of Lord Buddha. And media in Nepal, in the last two decades, the media has uh, developed in Nepal. Uh, before 20, 25 years, we had 
only one radio station, te one television uh, channel, and the few that newspapers, and almost all of them, they were owned by the government, by the state. But now there are many. Uh, there is very strong presence of private sector in the media. Now you, we have about 82 television channels and 628 FM radios and about 7,000 newspapers. Similarly, there are many online news portals and websites. And obviously, the media is a good source of news, information, communication, and entertainment. At Water Integrity Program, this is the program that we have been implementing in Nepal with support from Swiss Diplomat Cooperation and with technical uh, backstopping of Water Integrity Network. This is a very small program, and we are working in three out of 75 districts in the country. The yellow shaded area, uh, uh, they are the working districts of Water Integrity Program. They are far away, some 700 kilometers away to the west from the capital city, Kathmandu. And this is how we have been working with the media. This is our, this is our approach. Water Integrity Program, this supports uh, building capacity of the media person. This capacity building, especially in the war sector, you know. Uh, we provide them training, orientation on the uh, WAS issues, on the institutional arrangement of was sector in the country. Similarly, we orient them on different legal provisions in the sector. We provide them logistics, fellowship, and one important thing that we are doing now is we are supporting to form a was media forum so that the media, the journalists working in the was sector are better organized, and the agencies who want to support uh, to improve uh, integrity in the was sector, definitely they will have easier uh, easy to approach with the media. So once this was media forum uh, is established and legally registered, definitely will have a very good uh, time to working with the media. And through this support, we expect that media persons uh, promote support promoting integrity in was sector. And actually, this is not only the expectation, but in reality also, they have been contributing a lot to promote uh, better practices of transparency, accountability, and participation staff in the WASP sector. And here you can see this is the major thrust of this water integrity program, that ensuring or defending staff practices in the entire was sector, especially in the planning and budgeting, project implementation, and budget accounting. And here is the involvement of media. In the left-hand side, I have listed some newspapers, radios, television, uh, with uh, whom we are working, uh, whom we are supporting. And in the right-hand side, how they are involved in the sector. As you can see, they support disseminate information and create awareness, especially on the legal provision. Uh, they provide vast information. They provide information on budget and different agencies working in the sector, and they orient the people on the concept of this transparency, accountability, and participation. Similarly, on the concept of human right to water and sanitation. Again, you, I have used the abbreviation, sorry. HR2, WS, this is human right to water and sanitation. And media person, they have been reporting the WAS event at the different activities uh, in the WAS sector. Similarly, uh, uh, sometimes they are also publishing features and case, case studies in the WAS sector. And they have been supporting organized public hearing. I will uh, tell about this event in bit detail later. Media person participate in joint monitoring. This is the monitoring of uh, drinking water and sanitation project. They are randomly selected. Joint monitoring means the schemes, the projects are monitored by the media persons, by the representatives of the uh, water users committee, representatives of the political parties, and uh, uh, concerned government and non-government uh, agencies in the sector. And they also support communication and dialogue between the right holders and the duty bearers. And recently, media, this Nepal television, uh, this conducted one very 
good investigative and research on the WAS issues, especially in our working districts, three districts, and the intervention of water integrity program to better address that issues. And that was telecast from this channel. At public hearing, uh, this is uh, one uh, measure that the uh, event organized by radio journalists. Radio journalists, they go to the area where they conduct this public hearing. They uh, visit the area beforehand and collect the information on different type of wash issues. And they set up the ground for discussion based on their research, you know. And in this event, this event is uh, organized in a certain geographic area. Uh, we call it Village Development Committee. And all the people there, both the government and non-government agency and the users, they, are, they gather in, they participate in this event. And the users are provided opportunity to raise their concerns and demand better integrity with the concerned agencies. And the authorities present in that event, they respond to the questions and queries of the users. And in the same, same event, the concerned agencies, they make commitments uh, for corrective action whenever and wherever necessary. And the very interesting part of this event is this is aired live on radio as far as possible. Uh, as far as possible means we have very remote areas in our country in the hills. If there is that possibility of carrying the uh, equipment of the media person there, then only the program is not aired live, otherwise this is aired live. And now here I have arranged the photographs just to give you a feel how this public hearing event is conducted. Uh, here is the photographs of the event. Uh, to have some popular radio programs, there are many. I have just uh, brought here two as example. Uh, one is the Hamro Awaz, this is our voice in English, and the other is Shudr Sabal, the questions from remote areas. Uh, these two radio programs are quite popular uh, in our working areas. And here are some media cooperation was issues. Uh, all the that the issues cover, uh, they are in Nepali language. I, I, I don't think that you will understand, but uh, they are about issues in the war sector. Key message is, is obvious is the message that the media person, they have very important role in raising integrity as an issue and promoting their practices. And another important thing is that presence of media, you know, uh, makes the event more effective. If media persons are present there, definitely the concerned authorities will be more responsive to the uh, concerns of the people, and they take that seriously. Uh, wider dissemination of wash problems of the people draws attention of the concerned authorities, and that is also obvious. Uh, another, the last one I'm going to explain, Presence of the media makes people more confident to ask questions and demand better integrity. And this is very much important in the context like ours, you know. The people living in the remote areas, uh, they are not well educated. They don't have confidence. They hesitate to go to the concerned agencies to claim their eyes to ask about the better services, you know. So if the media accompany them, if there is the strong presence of media, definitely they feel more confident to go to the concerned agencies. And this is very much needed to improve integrity in the war sector, I think. Uh, some issues. Uh, politics is priority area of the media. In the country like ours, you know, most part of the newspapers or the television channels or the radio programs that is covered by the news related to politics, political events, species of the political leaders, you know, the other issues get... Uh, very less uh, space in the media. Linkage between the media houses and political parties. Uh, many of our media houses, you know, they are owned by the influential leaders of the influence, influential political parties. And this uh, poses question on the integrity of the media houses itself. 
And looking at the wash issues from the integrity lens, still the wash problems are not looked at from the integrity lens. You know, people just talk about their wash problems, like excess that the repairs and maintenance, you know, they don't uh, look at that problem from the integrity uh, lens. And another issue, uh, dependence on wash implementing agency for running the media, this is especially in the rural areas because the media person don't have uh, a good business out there, you know, there is no that the marketing activities, economic activities, so they cannot make uh, out money from this sources. And uh, some of them, not all, some of them have to depend on the uh, was agencies to get been this, you know, in form of that the publication of tender notice or the sponsorship program, advert advertisements type of thing, you know. If you are getting business from someone, then you cannot uh, state for what, uh, write or report against that agency. So that is the issues. Okay, this much from my side. Thank you very much. I hope the plenary will <laughs> provide valuable inputs to address these issues. Thank, Thank you, you, Fred. Just stay there just one moment. Um, that, was, I mean, that was fascinating. I mean, it was very kind of empowering um, and a really very hopeful story about, about what's going on. I, I imagine that in amongst the collaboration and the discussion and the kind of goodwill that you have sort of conflicts and, and, and problems that are quite hard to uh, solve. I wondered if you could give us any example of um, you know specific issue which uh, you know what the problem was and how um, your process helped perhaps to resolve it. So is any any I mean I, I don't want to sort of put you in a difficult position with any any individual stories, but are, are there any individual examples that, that you can think of that um, kind of exemplify? Uh, yes, uh, about uh, uh, about the access to information, you know. Uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have published that was investment plan of the districts and media persons, uh, especially the radio programs, they have been putting that was uh, uh, district was development plan on the media. And people are getting to know what is, which agency is doing what and how much budget is allocated in that particular sector. Mm -hmm. And based on that information, you know, the people go to the uh, concerned agencies uh, to or demand uh, right uh, proper use of the budget allocated in their area. So that is one example. What, what are the agencies that they um, uh, go to most? What are the, what are the kind of critical agencies? Uh, there are both the government and the non-government, you know. Mm -hmm. We have uh, uh, that uh, Blaze Development Committee and the District Development Committees uh, uh, at the local level which look after this deployment activities, we plan the deployment activities at the local level and implement. And mm -hmm. similarly, there are different uh, that uh, non-government organizations. You know, also, they have got a very good, uh, big amount of budget allocated in this sector. Mm -hmm. And uh, the people, they go to both the agencies, government as well as non-government agencies. But uh, they, they, they have problem, more problem with the government agencies. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. That was great. great. Thank you. I, sh I should just say that after, after the third question, we'll have, um, we'll have a, a chance for, for a bit of Q&A and responses. And I know I've had a note about one specific response from the, the first presentation. Um, and we'll deal with those after our next speaker. Um, so please come up, uh, Jacopo. You've seen him already. Um, he's going to talk about scarcity and abundance, documenting citizen reactions to water management issues in Latin America. So we're moving on to a third continent. Thank you, Fred. Um, well, I, I, I was thinking when you were talking initially, um, I had a, some couple of uh, ideas to introduce you to this presentation, but then I, when I heard you speaking about the roles and, and our backgrounds here in the room, I completely shifted to something different, and which is actually it's interesting that you brought the, the attention and the fact that the role of journalists should be interpreted as more... It's a naming and shaming style of doing things. And that's exactly one of the things that I would like to stress, which is 
that is why it's important to have such events where also the voice of uh, NGO uh, that, uh, that do care about this is, um, is put in, in, in relation to the role of journalists. Because uh, I can talk about my own organization, Water Integrity Network. Surely we don't do na naming and shaming. But that, that, this is not a point. I mean, our role is different in that sense because uh, what we would, let me just get back for, for, for a second at uh, the very beginning of our story since 2006 when we started. Um, you know, uh, in, the, in the decades of the 90s, um, started the, the overall discussion about corruption and the role of good governance and so on and so forth. But when we started investigating on the importance of corruption in water, that was exactly because we wanted to provide more evidence on what is working and what is not working uh, in the global development when we talk about corruption, especially in the water sector. So um, we interpret our role as, or we should interpret our role as supporting this type of action provided by journalists. And we do care um, as, as much as you care about the importance of the sources of information about the stories. But what we do with those stories is try to raise the awareness of what is really relevant to make a change. So uh, some of the hints that I will try to provide here are uh, not exhaustive. Of course, I cannot talk about uh, a case very deeply in, in 10 minutes, of course. But it's just an idea of um, uh, how we perceive our, these different roles and why it is so important to find a way to collaborate more strongly. Um, I also would like to uh, talk about, here I put it like active citizenry, because I think that uh, no matter what the topic is, and no matter what the country in, uh, is, I mean, we do work for the same, uh, uh, you know, big goal, which is to have better services for our citizens, to have better rights uh, for our citizens in a way, or more uh, efficient way to, to provide water services in this case. So ultimately, we, we do not have to miss that point out from our conversation because we don't want this uh, uh, exercise becoming too technical uh, to lose the sight of what is really relevant, which is the benefit of, of, of people. So the three cases today will try to, um, um, in a way, explain in very different, uh, with very different approaches why is relevant this sort of collaboration. So the first case uh, is something that we um, explored uh, um, along with the, um, the same period, the, the same journalist who, who wrote this, uh, this article and was actually awarded with an important prize in Latin America for investigative journalism in 2014. And um, it's about the, the long-term process of um, um, you know, privatization of, of, of water in, in, uh, in Chile. But we, we are not going to talk about the, 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 the political issue that they, they spend a lot of time in, in deciding if it's better to amend the water law or amend the constitution. This is not the topic. The topic is this journalist spent um, a lot of time getting to the source of information, speaking with people, speaking with farmers in the north of the country that were cut out of the services because water rights were um, sold out to some, some companies. Um, and, uh, and people involved were not concerned, uh, well, were not in, involved in the, in the decision process. So uh, the work that these journalists started to do was, you know, uh, everybody was uh, focused on the political process and losing the side on what it was happening to the citizens. So that's why we, f we, we found was interesting. We interview him and uh, we talk, and we actually ma made a blog post on it, but um, this is a case where you really sense that it's a service provided to, to, to citizens that otherwise wouldn't have a chance to know about this, what is going on in here. The second case uh, I would like to mention is something not yet published, but about to publish. It's a PhD thesis about to publish by the Humboldt University in Germany. And this young researcher from Colombia, um, th that's really interesting. She started the, the investigation, the research, investigating basically uh, the disconnections from water services in um, low-income uh, neighborhoods in Medellin, Colombia. You know, typically understanding why the disconnection happened, uh, what was the decision from the, uh, the, the point of view of the provider, from the point of view of, of citizens, and ended up discovering an entire world of um, participation of criminal groups in the management of, of water pipes that was totally unexpected 
And so she developed herself a survey to uh, understand by interviewing uh, house per house, I mean households, and, uh, and understanding why these people being disconnected was approached by, were approached by um, uh, criminal groups, uh, in this case the Bakrim operating in, in uh, um, suburbs of Medellin. And the interesting thing is um, she, uh, she f uh, found a lot of interest for um, the, the topic as such. Uh, families, of course, do care about water connection, but of course they were afraid of providing information and, be, and of course, the retaliation of, of both the criminal groups and, and other uh, living uh, in the same area. So um, the security level that uh, was... Um, you know, at stake in this sort of investigation was uh, completely changed uh, in the middle of the, of, of the research, which is also something that uh, she took uh, on board and she uh, also uh, achieved to manage in a, in, a, in, a, in a good way. The third case is about um, a reportage published by The Guardian, um, uh, where actually we had a chance to interview... Um, uh, the photographer who took um, uh, care of all the pictures included in the reportage. And uh, the, the interesting story here, here is we're talking about one of the uh, most, uh, I don't know if there are any Brazilian in here, but it's a quite known favela in, Sa in Sao Paulo, uh, Favela do Moinho. We're talking about, about yeah, 2,500 uh, residents that are, are relying just on a, on a single blue pipe uh, for water connection. And the interesting part, the relevant part of the story is uh, they have been trying a lot to uh, claim, I mean, to uh, sensitize the municipality for um, a proper water connection, and they didn't, su su uh, help, uh, didn't achieve it. But uh, in a way, um, that pushed them to um, start a community discussion where they were supported by an NGO locally, and they started to understand that they need to make their voice aloud. So that's why the story uh, started, and uh, this, this young journalist started the investigation, and actually uh, was, uh, if you want, a demand from, from citizens in, in a way. Of course, she had to verify all the sources of information to take care of all the, the due process, but ultimately it was something very in the light of uh, providing them a service, because otherwise their voice uh, couldn't be heard. So... I found that, uh, in a way, uh, all these stories as, uh, may have factors in common. Uh, this is, of course, not a scientific analysis I would like to, sh uh, to, to share with you, but still it offers some point of context, um, uh, talking about those factors that, in a way, can help us find commonalities in terms of the availability of information, first of all, um, uh, but then also the, the, the engagement with citizens the security of the environment, and last but not least, the collaboration of institutions. So um, this is really, uh, again, a rough uh, scheme, but uh, you may say that even when the level of, for example, taking the, the, the security of the environment um, under examination, they are very different uh, among each other in these cases. Nevertheless, they achieve to deliver uh, the product. Nevertheless, they achieve to contact the community leaders and have them on board while investigating these issues. So that talks also about uh, the level, the required level of engagement with citizens. So uh, when they approach these communities, the entry point, the main entry point was uh, via community leaders that in a way helped the, 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 the situation to be to be um, easier for them. Um, so let me just get back to uh, some of the cases while I uh, try to highlight um, uh, some notes that, that I found um, that make me um, think about uh, our role and the role of journalists. Um, in the case of Colombia, um, she found that the, the sensitiveness uh, involved in this investigation was um, so relevant that building trust with, with, with the community was even more important than having you know, all the data already 
prepared and all the, the, the statistics, if you want. They, the, the, she has been looking for a lot of, of figures and data with, via the municipality, for example. But then she understood that it was crucial to have their trust before anything else. Um, and aside of, I mean, on top of it, uh, in the second case I, I, I'm bringing here in, uh, under consideration, the Chilean one, um, this, this, this journalist, while talking with us, say, you know what, uh, all the newspaper, and that is something that I, that I really think uh, it's not only for the, for the water sector, but it's for the, for the governance sector in general. Uh, he was saying, you know, all the newspaper were talking about big scandals, big movements of parties deciding or not deciding to um, amend the constitution. And they were totally, uh, you know, forgetting about the most important thing. And of course, the citizens and the, and the rights of citizens, but even more importantly, by consulting each other, by talking uh, with other parties, they are losing time, and time is precious. And there are people cut it off, cut it out of services that are about to collapse in the north of the region, and no one is doing nothing, because they are spending time in things that are political processes, but that are not up to speed with needs of, of people. So. Again, uh, just to briefly wrap up, um, I think that, I mean, um, I don't want to provide uh, hints for, for journalism. I mean, you are the specialist, you are the expert, you know how to approach stories. What I'm saying here, um, our role, I mean, the role of NGOs in this crucial uh, issue is uh, more of, um, you know, supporting you, providing those contacts to have entry point, to build the trust with the community, to also make sure that community leaders are aware of what, what are the sense of what you're doing and why you're doing that. Um, not looking for uh, you know, an award or a space in the, in the newspaper uh, uh, to become famous, but because you do care about communities and what is happening uh, with them. Uh, so ultimately, I mean, that's why we prefer to talk about, and we do believe in water, in water integrity, not only because uh, we think it, it makes sense uh, to ensure better services, uh, better water services for, for everybody and more equitable services, but also because in this uh, risky situation and, um, and where the security levels are low, uh, it's, we need to take care of, uh, of the approach we use. And sometimes talking, uh, talking about corruption very openly, even if it's right, even if it's honest, may you know, provide uh, even additional fears in communities, and so they cannot open up to disclosing the real problem. So we need also to, uh, I agree in that sense with Magda, and the, the wording it's, it needs to be appropriate, and, and, and in a way it's very important that we do understand that we are not in the position to offer them more risk than those that, I, that they are already facing themselves. So, thank you. Yeah, that was, that was, that was again, fascinating. Um, uh, you kind of half answered my question that I was going to get to towards the end, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway. I mean, us journalists, we tend to have this sort of slight image of ourselves as these sort of heroic kind of Woodward and Bernstein kind of figures going out and doing gonzo journalism and investigative stuff, but, um, and naming and shaming, as I said earlier. But you're giving us a very different picture of the journalist's proper role as being uh, to give communities a voice, to give the poor a voice, the people without a voice. Um, I mean, you've had some examples of how that seems to have played out quite well. Is, is that your general experience, or do you sometimes find that journalists are, are really do want the award and don't really want to be that much help? Well, no, I mean, my point was, uh, you know, sometimes, especially for organizations like, uh, I, I, I find it interesting, the, uh, the starting also of when Magda said, I was based in London and my colleague was based in, in Kenya. And, you know, it's usually difficult for us as an organization, smaller organization, to really get the sense of what is happening in the field, uh, not, not in terms of, of the topic as such, but also having this... Um, sensitivity for what is uh, uh, the, the, the topic and how to treat it, um, how to talk about it, how to uh, unfold it, if you want. 
and mm -hmm. journalists are key for, for in, in that sense. I mean, if you ask me if, if I consider you heroes, I would say, yeah, sure. I mean, a lot of, of journalists that uh, are in, in danger and they, they are, uh, you know, uh, threatened with uh, um, uh, criminal groups trying to, to, to kill them. I mean, I'm, I'm from Italy. Um, I mean, Roberto Saviano is hidden somewhere because mafia is, is looking for him. So, uh, I mean, the, the point is, I really do think that each one should be good at his job. And so, uh, and at the point where we do recognize our boundaries, if you want, or our roles, that would be a point for better collaboration. So, um, that's okay. how I see it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, no, we'll, we'll stay here, because I think we're going to have, if we can have the other two presenters up as well. Would you come up now? And we'll have a Q&A, or briefly. Yes, please. Yes. I'll share this one. If you want to take that microphone, I'll, uh, I'll share this one. If we can share this microphone, that should work. Um, for, well, no, okay. Um, first, I had, a, I had a question which I would like to prioritize from somebody from Nairobi City Water. Um, yes, please. Um, you, you, are, you obviously deserve a right of reply in, in terms of the context of the first discussion about Kibera. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, uh, very good presentation for the city of Nairobi. Well, I'm from Nairobi Water. My name is Mbaru Kuvyakweli. I'm actually the head of corporate communications and for that matter, the spokesman of that company. So when she mentioned that um, she spoke to people in Nairobi Water and uh, she got some answers. I was curious to know exactly what uh, type of answers she got. But again, yeah, when you use uh, the word mafia, he's from Italy, he used it. You see, mafia indicates like uh, it's a place where there is no order, where the cartels are ruling, where these people can do anything, and um, the government or the company is powerless. But I want to say that um, for Nairobi Water, that is not the case. Actually, um, um, I'm happy that you did that investigative part. Now, um, you were talking of illegal connections. I think that is what is uh, existing. It's mostly about illegal connections, and um, this contributes uh, greatly to what we call non-revenue water. Uh, we know we are aware that is happening, and uh, we are aware that there may be some cartels and I'm happy that, I'm glad that you also mentioned that uh, Nairobi Water is uh, looking into solving that issue. We have actually, to answer, uh, the, to respond to that, we have actually invited a company from, um, uh, from Denmark, Grundfos, if you know Grundfos. Uh, we recently launched a new uh, product called uh, EQTAP. That uh, EQTAP is, um, is a machine where you can uh, dispense water. It's... Um, ATM machine for water, where you have, um, you have um, it's a very good technology where you have a token, you're given a token, and uh, you go and um, place it at the, at, the, at the ATM machine and you get your water. And uh, you know that is because of the cartels that you're talking about, that, um, you know, they were selling water in informal settlements at a very high price. Now, for us to... Um, to tame them, we had to come up with this um, um, new solution. Now, while they while they are they're, they're selling uh, 20 liters of jerry can of water, uh, very highly, uh, to 10 shillings or so, um, you can get the same like now, you can get the same at 20 20 cents, the same amount at 20 cents. So people already know that um, we have started in one informal settlement, and it is actually. Uh, rolling is a program that is rolling out to uh, Kibera slums, like like you're saying. I think the next phase will be in Kibera, and there are a number of uh, two or three informal settlements. There is where we are moving to. Okay. But uh, the idea is um, the cartels. Not really. Not that they are very powerful, but uh, if they were, they would have uh, uh, they would have actually done something about the new solution that we have come up with. 
but okay, uh, okay, thank you. I'm, I'm going to stop it there because I want to get some other questions. But thank you very much thank indeed you. for that. Thank you, uh, Mag. Do you, do you want to respond briefly? I know, I know you're based in London rather than Nairobi, but uh, any, anything immediate? Uh, well, uh, I'm, I don't remember the name of a person. My colleague Katie spoke to in Nairobi. Maybe it was you, but you, you would have remembered, I guess, uh, talking to us. But um, in, in, in relation to your, your comment, uh, what we were told back in 2014, I think it was in November, was that uh, Nairobi Water told us that the number of people, those, uh, the, the water mafia people were so high that whenever Nairobi Water was trying to crack down on them, they would come back after, after some time. So I'm really glad to hear that you are trying to uh, solve that situation because it was the, the people, mainly women, who were, uh, who were affected by, by those issues. I would be happy to have a chat after the session not to keep everybody sure. waiting. Okay, that's, that's splendid. Can we have a couple of questions, um, not necessarily about Kibera, indeed, hopefully about somewhere else? Um, yes, please. There's a question here in the front. You just wait for the microphone. And if you'd say who you are and if it's directed to an individual, please Hi, say who. Yes, uh, I'm Tetra Posas. I'm a freelance journalist. Um, my question is on the factor of culture because it looks like your presentations have interjections of culture in, in, in um, whether it's the root cause or um, it's the solution or how you look at it. Um, it comes to the notion that the, variab the variability of culture um, all is, has a direct connection to uh, the question of corruption or corruptibility in a certain area or region or location. So how uh, do you see um, culture factor in in your um, specific uh, cases? Okay, well, that's, it. that's interesting. Is, is, to what extent is corruption a cultural kind of artifact? Who, who, do you want to go? Who, who'd you like to go at that? Me? Well, I, as you know, I, I, I don't... Um, Jacopo, if you, if you feel happy to respond, then that's yeah, fine. Yeah, definitely, I, I think that the culture is the important factor, you know, because... Uh, this is your orientation, your, your level of awareness, education, you know, that all uh, determine, uh, to, uh, determine your journey towards the better integrity. So if the people, uh, one of my friends from Bangladesh, he was saying that the, he was talking about the cohesive, that corruption, you know. If both the parties, that, uh, that is, uh, they are benefited by that corruption, definitely the situation will be worse and that will not improve. So definitely it's a matter of culture. Uh, the, the, the countries we are, which are not that, uh, uh, what you say, uh, supportive to this type of practices, who, who are very much straightforward to their claims, uh, their rights, you know, definitely the, the, there is better potential for improving integrity. Okay, Jacobo? Yeah. All right. The example is, I can give you example of my own country, you know. So, uh, there are the cases of corruption reported, even when you are going to pay the, the telephone bill, you know. So, if you give some money to the counter, definitely your work will be done sooner than that of others. So, that is up to you. That is not the authority or the person who is there uh, doing corruption. That is you. You are doing corruption. You know, you are promoting. You are just uh, making that environment stronger and potential for that type of corruption. So, it's a matter of culture. It, uh, it's a matter of uh, waking up, up for your rights. It takes two to be corrupt, but Jacopo. Yeah, no, just v very briefly. I would say that as long as uh, cultural elements are taken into account as one of the factors that may determine uh, the, the size and the shape of, of, of corruption, then, uh, then we, we can talk about it. Otherwise, it moves, and, and I think in that sense is the $1 million question is uh, whether, corruption, whether culture is used in a, as an excuse not to fight corruption. In that case, this is an endless conversation that I don't think it's the case of having here, but I think that there are many uh, factors and many uh, organizations that do think that, in a way, um, excuses not to do something for corruption are part of the corrupt system as well. 
Do we have one more question? Um, yeah. No, no, sorry. I, I think we better I'll move on to another, another question here. Yes, please. My name is Babatokwe Babalubi. I'm the chair of the Water and Sanitation Media Network, Nigeria. Um, my quick question is for Mad, uh, Madda. Um, you mentioned in your presentation um, that's a statement that don't offer um, gifts you know, or money. Of course, I know there are ethical issues about uh, offering gifts or money, but at times there is a cost um, that uh, you may need to incur in sourcing information, you know, in sourcing stories. Um, um, that was a particular instance. I just used that as, as a case study. I needed a document from a government in, in Nigeria. It was the water law that was passed. It was released to the public, and I have to go to the government house. And the, the, the officer that had the document, just one document, the Lagos State Water Law, it wasn't released. You know, demanded for money to make a photocopy. You know, and I had to part with the money to, for him to make a, a photocopy of the water law. You know, because mm -hmm. I need to have that document before I could write my story. So, but what I'm just saying broadly is that it, sometimes in sourcing information, um, there are some cost you need to incur, you know, and when I saw that statement that don't offer gift or something, uh, I was really um, a bit at a loss. Okay, you know. thank you. Uh, well, I guess there are uh, different types of costs. So one cost is that if you're doing a story, you need to cover your travels and so on. There are sometimes documents on the internet that you need to pay for to, to get them released. However, I don't know this case, but I understand that somebody asked you to pay them for, to make a copy. So was it that they would ask anyone? If, if I came, not as a journalist, but as a citizen and requested the information, would they also ask me to pay for the copy? Is it like a, a practice in that government that they require payments for copy? Or was it basically, was he asking you to pay a bribe to get the information? Oh. So officially, and we have the FOI, the figure of information at the year and X, such documents that are officially. As of that time, officially, it wasn't supposed to be costly, but certainly, the government was supposed to release that document, but it wasn't released. Okay. Well, so, so basically, he wasn't. Uh, do I understand correctly? He was not supposed to release, it wasn't an official information or widely available, but he said, I can give it to you if you give me money. It's a public document. It was supposed to be in the public domain. You know, it's a public document. It's the Lagos State Water Law. So it's a public document. It's supposed to be in the public domain, you know, but it was in the public domain, and I needed that law. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, I think we're going to have to go on a halt on that one. Um, <laughs> It happens a lot of places. They charge you for, uh, for printing off documents when, uh, you know, I, I think in this case it looks like, I'm sorry to this, uh, right, interrupt, but it seems like, to me, like a bribe, basically. Or no, he's, uh, well, unless it might be a bribe, but I mean, it's just, it's just for, for, for photocopy. But we're, we're oh, going to have to stop there. We're yeah. going to have to stop. Um, okay, we're going we're gonna, to, if you'll uh, give some applause, please, for our, our presenters, because we're going to move on. We now are going to have a panel session with um, four complete other people. Um, I hope that the three, other, the three presenters will stick around and contribute to the discussion which is coming up. But I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, I'm hoping that the four people I have on my list are in the room because I don't actually know. Yeah, okay, now I've got the list. Uh, David Truber. Yep, please, David. And if you want to put those in front of people as they... I think we're going to have, we only have three microphones, but we'll, 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 we'll huddle, up, huddle up close, and I hope that'll work. Uh, Baba Tope Baba Lobi, if I've got that right? Yeah. Yes, please. Ah, okay, thank you. And Stella Paul. And Sele Marios Kawasi. Kawasi. Excellent. We have a full set. That's, that's a relief. <laughs> and I hope you can share the microphone. So I'm going to hog this one over here, for which apologies. Um, we're going to open this up to, to questions from the audience. Um, 
uh, as, briefly, but initially I just wondered um, if each of you would like to respond to um, what we've heard so far. Um, you know, a number of quite critical issues have come out. Um, you, don't, you don't have to respond, but if there's anything you'd like to say in response to the three presentations, then, then please do. Um, why don't we start with Stella? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, I was actually hearing Magda. Hi, I also write for TRF, so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, I do basically like, agree to all of that you guys talked about, but I do think that there was something very important that was missing. There's a perspective of a journalist who actually works in a developing country and just faces the transparency and the oh, integrity, or rather the lack of it, every single day. And the big job of staying alive, you know. So that's probably something I think I or, and Slay could bring over here. You know, that's, Okay, please. Uh, I, I have given initial response in my comments, yeah. um, but I just want to say further that I was really fascinated by the Nepalese uh, um, presentation uh, because what is going on in Nigeria is very similar to that. Um, I had the Water and Sanitation Media Network in Nigeria, and I was also the immediate past uh, General Secretary of the West African Water Supply and Sanitation Journalist Network. And I just want to say that um, for, I mean, journalists need stories, and these stories come from sources. And for you to get, and the water sector is a very te technical area. So for you to get the stories either from service providers, from the utilities, um, to get stories from regulators, from policy makers, or even users, because corruption, there are different levels of integrity and various categories. You need to partner strategically um, with various non slick actors. In, in these areas. And briefly, I'm, I'm just going to mention them. The community-based organizations working on these issues are very strategic. Um, the NGOs working on this issue um, are very strategic. In some countries, we have national networks of water supply and sanitation um, NGOs. We also have international NGOs um, like Water Aid, like Concern Universal, like WSSCC that uh, David will talk more about. So it's good for journalists either as individuals or on the basis of their networks. If there is a national network, for you to partner with them. In Nigeria, I just concluded with this. Um, we have the journalist network. We also have um, the NewSan, which is the civil society network on water and sanitation. About five years ago, we even went to the center of signing an MOU with them, a memorandum of understanding, you know, um, by which in each state in which our journalists are working, um, the, 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 um, I mean, the CSO give them, give them information. I also want to say that another group that is very strategic in the water sector is the, is the workers unions. Um, at the international level, we have the Public Service International, and they have affinities all over the world. And in each country, they have national unions. Of course, when you are talking of integrity, the people that will have the best information in their fingertips are the workers in the union. So PSI affinities in country, I mean, on the contextual issues of um, water pricing, privatization, for instance, PSI has done so much work, so more research on it, and there are local affinities also, who are working in various water utilities, you know, in, in country, they have so much information. So it's very strategic for journal journalists, either as individuals, or where there are national networks, for them to partner with these local non state actors as sources of information. Great, thank you. David? Oh, thanks very much. Um, it's great to see everybody up here on the panel. It's like seeing a lot of old friends as well. Um, I heard some very interesting things in the presentations that resonated, uh, some key words and some very specific examples. Uh, I mean, one key word, I, I think it uh, was in uh, Yogesh's presentation, was talking about duty bearers and rights holders. Uh, I think that's very important because um, ultimately we're talking about uh, people getting access to services or to um, you know, commodities, they could be food, not just water, uh, that they have a human right to. And we're entering this SDG era and, um, okay, I guess the, the municipal water authority in, in Nairobi was being held to account a little bit through the example that was giving. But beyond that, when we look at the SDGs that are coming up, and there's a water goal that has targets and indicators um, on water and sanitation and water resources management, ultimately it's member states 
that are going to be accountable to that. And they're the ones that I think journalists should then really hold to account in the coming SDG era. How have they taken what they've signed up to internationally and applying it and delivering on it in a national context? So that's very interesting. I mean, the, the role of, of, of accountability that uh, is so important um, for journalists in, in getting duty bearers to, to own up to what they've promised to. And actually, to be fair to um, Babalobi, um, he did talk about the importance of the partnerships uh, with maybe organizations uh, within the sector. And my own organization, WSSCC, has, has worked, not always as strongly as we should have, I think, wanted to with the West Africa Water Jur Wash Journalist Network. But even those organizations that aren't municipalities, they need to be held to account as well. There's nobody that should be given a free pass. And I don't care if it's the Global Fund to Fight HIV AIDS TB, WHO, UNICEF, WSSCC, whomever. If they are out claiming that they're doing something in this development business, if they're getting results, uh, you know, I would hope that a journalist is coming and asking us and saying, oh, you said that you've got five million people with access to safe drinking water. Did you really? Prove it. Is it going to last? Was it done equitably? So even these organizations, it's not just uh, maybe private sector corporations or municipal authorities that, that should be held to account, but it's even organizations that are, that are working in the sector that are very, very interesting. And I noticed in Yogesh's presentation, and I think that Jacobo and our friends at Wynn, um, they work a lot with this TAP approach, which was great, transparency, accountability, and participation. And the middle one of those three in, in Yogesh's um, slide was about... Uh, you know, monitoring and, and, and taking a stock check uh, of actual implementation. And I would draw a line even one step further from that, again, linking to the results. Okay, you implemented. What did you achieve? So holding to account, uh, it's got to do with everybody who's involved in this process, whether it's uh, municipal authorities, it's the private sector, it's uh, local, regional, or national government, or it's a national NGO or an international NGO or a multilateral mm -hmm. agency. They all should be open to scrutiny, I think, by, by journalists. And then the very last point, sorry I went on so long, was it was mentioned a few times, but the issue of the security and the safety of journalists. We know that, that journalism in general in this world today, it's under attack. How is it under attack? Well, uh, there's the social media, there's the attack on journalistic ethics. You know, um, the first presentation, very good. You're talking about getting multiple sources, but I think if we all go to a lot of online blogs or places, we'll see that there aren't multiple sources being con consulted. There are, journalists are also under attack because they're maybe not compensated very well. Advertising revenues are going down because so much is going to, to, to the digital domain. And then they're also under attack if they're investigating something that has to deal with water mafias. They, their lives might physically be threatened, and we can, we can never, ever forget that, and especially those of us who work in international agencies or in, let's call it Europe or America or some other place, I mean, we really have to defer to the experience and the expertise of the kinds of people who are around this, uh, this panel right now because uh, they're living and working in that situation. So, okay, sorry. Okay, thank you everybody and congratulations for your presentation. Uh, thank you for your efforts. Actually, water issues are very crucial issues, yet they are not given the coverage they deserve. And I would like to congratulate you for this effort. Uh, the next thing is, uh, you had a good presentation and I saw the list of the tips you mentioned. And I was interested in one of them, which is, I think it's no undercover journalists. But we should not forget that in the African context, uncovering corruption is a very risky business. And holding politicians accountable for their action is something very dangerous, and sometimes journalists have to pay a heavy price for that. So for me, I would love you to show some of the tips you have to you know, share with your colleague or even citizen who use a mobile phone to report on you know, corruption cases. Because I'm telling you, it's a risky business. And well, uh, for the presentation of, I don't know, it's the, the guy from India, <laughs> I think involving, Nepal. yes, <laughs> okay, Nepal. What, Paul, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> getting, let's say, media in the game, working hand in hand with them is a, is a good thing, but uh, I saw newspaper, uh, radio, TV, but for me, your strategy like a, mo one of the important part of modern communication. I mean, using online platform to just you know share ideas. It's things that help news go you know very quickly and fast and for a very large impact. I don't know why. Maybe you can elaborate on that. 
Okay, thank you. That's that, that was all really interesting stuff. Okay, Q, Q and A now. Who has some questions? Um, say who you are, and um, yeah, over here. Okay, I'm Michael Lauren from Water for All here in Sweden. Um, thank you for the presentations and for the Q and A. Uh, what I'm looking for, uh, you mentioned name and shame. I think that is very important, but. I miss one thing, and that is actually education. Many poor people out in the rural world just doesn't know which rights they are, which rights they have, what they can do, how they can um, advocate on policymakers, on local authorities, and so on. And I think that's also an important thing for the journalism, especially for the radio. Uh, because they are literates and, and so on. So okay. um, just a Sorry. comment about that. Yeah, um, so there, are, there are often two versions of journalism which, which come out, one of which is that the mission to expose and the other is the mission to explain. And I guess you're talking about the mission to explain bit. But um, would anybody want to comment on that? No, yeah, it's because a, it's a that good... can move the grassroots level, so to say, yeah. to, to engage and set forces on, on their decision makers. Yeah. We had, I mean, we, we had some good stuff from Nepal, I think, on that, on that earlier. But does anybody want to add on the, uh, uh, the educational aspect of, of media work, just, to, just telling people what their rights are? Yeah? yeah. No, we can go. <laughs> okay, just a, just a quick thought on that. I mean, um, yes, you mentioned name and shame. I guess to use another very bad and probably overly worn expression, shock and awe. <laughs> there's that kind of journalistic approach, right? Yeah. But then there's also the sort of sl slow, steady drumbeat, which I think is more linked to education and awareness mm -hmm. building. And, and this might be on issues that are maybe more mundane in the long term. They're not like headline news, but they're very important or even more important in the long term, such as, you know, hey, you have a human right to education or to food or to water and sanitation. So I think the challenge there for journalists, and again, I'm, I'm, I really defer to my colleagues who are here who, working, who are working on a day-to-day -day basis because it's easier to say what I'm about to say than it is to actually do it, but the challenge for journalists is to actually think of these stories in, 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 uh, in terms of, well, what makes good news? And, you know, it's often the superlatives, the first, the only, the greatest, the best, the last, the newest. These are things that you can often see in a headline, and if we can think of water sanitation, hygiene, water resources as stories that aren't about water, sanitation, hygiene, and water resources, but they're stories about politics and power and, um, um, I don't know, sex appeal or any number of other things that, that typically are found in the political reporting story that I think was mentioned by the first speaker today. That's one way to start to, you know, have an incremental buildup in the number of mm -hmm. stories and a related uh, level of awareness raising. Okay, thank you. Anybody want to add anything? Or is, no, okay, another question. Um, yes, sir. Uh, this is Sanjeev Bisha Sanjay from Bangladesh Water Integrity Network. So, uh, I was basically uh, uh, focusing, uh, or I want to say that I am a very privileged person uh, from the perspective of journalists because uh, the organization for which I am working uh, we have a very good relationship with the journalists and the media. So, uh, sorry, I, do get your question because I want to get yeah. settled in. So, but my question is like, um, we have three parties, journalists, the uh, uh, NGO people and the government people. So sometimes the journalists uh, used to do reporting in terms of uh, subjective basis or um, not in a object, not in an objective basis. So that creates confusion among the parties that are involved in the process. So uh, what could be the uh, strategy or, or what is the, uh, uh, I would say, the options that we people could take to uh, remove this kind of, I would say, uh, unbelief or lack of trust uh, kind of things. So am I clear? Anybody want to go at that? How to deal with bad journalism, is it? <laughs> I'm not really too sure I understand the question. Are you speaking from the perspective of an NGO person? Yeah. Okay. I think citizen journalism has, has uh, broken barriers. You know, um, as a citizen, 
you can report yourself and post. You know, if journalist is subjective and if the if the uh, journalistic association in country um, there is a cartel that has even been built, if the journalists, for instance, have been a mafia, um, you as citizens can raise the flag. You know, um, um, there are social a lot of social media platforms. You know that um, are available for you. Um, in, in Nigeria, for instance, a, a lot of sensitive stories are not broken by the traditional media, you know, because of a lot of factors that have been identified before. But a lot of social media sites, as I know, a lot of journalists are even retiring and setting up online, I mean, only online media sites, you know. So um, I, I would say things with journalism is, is breaking, uh, be solving that problem, and you can start if you don't have a blog today, for instance. Um, WordPress will tell you that within five seconds you can start blogging. <laughs> okay, Senator, so yes, please. So, if I understand uh, that there's also a significant uh, trust deficit between the civil society and the government, and for very good reasons, different reasons altogether. Um, but speaking from uh, the perspective of an uh, investigative journalist who focuses on uh, purely on the extreme vulnerable communities, uh, especially climate uh, refugees. Um, I would say um, that, uh, I would give probably an example to, to, to answer your question. The best way to do is to do my job with honesty and integrity. There is no other way to, you know, you can't skirt around, you can't do a story on water integrity or any kind of environmental or integrity without letting go of your own integrity in your profession. So today, this morning, uh, my latest story was published on, I write for, besides uh, uh, Thompson Writers Foundation, I write for Interpret Service. And today's story was on a very crucial water issue, which is an uh, integrated issue, which is river and sand mining. It's, it's a huge, huge mafia. Uh, just in past 10 years, in one state, India has got, I'm based in India, but I cover South Asia. So in one of the 29 states of India, uh, the, the, the sand mafia or illicit sand, river in sand ma mining has cost or bled the government of 2 million US dollars. So that's the extent. You can imagine how much money uh, the government is losing when it comes down to the entire country. Now, I want, I actually, it took me nearly five months to, to do this story. Uh, that's probably a lot, and a lot of my colleagues won't have that kind of time for different reasons. But uh, uh, it took, out of that five months, uh, it took nearly three months for me to actually talk to all the people that I did and, uh, you know, source my information. Now, during this, I, I, I first I started on my approaching. I mean, I started from the government side because they had a project where the government is actually leading. You know, government has given uh, the license and therefore the government is the main stakeholder there. Then I went down to the community and then obviously I had to talk to the civil society. So I, I talked to a, a mining, anti-mining network and, uh, well, you know, there were two very contrasting views that came out. The first uh, reply from the government side was that it's a super success, very, very successful uh, project, you know, uh, the mining project. We are doing everything right. So my mom says that, you know, when a person is coming out a little too strong on the, you know, uh, uh, like humbleness side, be, be time to be alert. You know, why is it being too humble? Why is it being too gentle? There has to be something wrong, you know. So, <laughs> so that's, that's something that I do follow. If, if the government is like painting all hunky-dory, all rosy, there is, has to be something wrong. So that's, that's <laughs> as an investigative journalism, that's where you first take the break, you know. And the same thing happens, I'm sorry to say, a lot of times with the NGO sector as well. They just go dismissing, you know, it's a blanket dismissal of whatever the government is doing. It's, ah, it's all rubbish. It's all, it, there's, there's a lot of bad stuff going on. So, so how do you, you know, it's like t you are hitting two walls, you know? So you can see the trust deficit, it's right on your face. And you have to do your job, you have to take out, dig out the story. So I say that I could give enough time. I had to talk to different people, go back and forth. A lot of credit goes back to my editor as well for asking extra questions. But in the, at the end of the day, when I actually, my story is today out, I'm getting some emails from the people. I think that even 
the, the, the lady the, uh, from the anti-mining group, she is now ready to look at, because this is a solution-oriented story. This is like, you know, uh, it's like promoting women leadership, you know, letting women take charge of sand uh, mining, wherever it's scientifically, you know, it's feasible to do so, let the women take charge. So that's the story. So in an ex extremely adverse, or in the middle of extreme adversities, you were trying to tell a story that has a possible solution, and therefore a greater room for engagement for your readers. Okay. That's the goal. We, we better stop I, there. I, I, I want to get so, another so question. So you have to just do your story. That's it. There's okay. no other Great. option. Yeah. Uh, one more question I want to get. Yeah, what, right at the back. Thank you. Ellen Pfeiffer from the Managing for Sustainability in the Netherlands. I have a question. One of the most visible corruption measures in the world, the Corruption Perception Index, is in this word connected to journalism. Perceptions are influenced by reporting. And I have seen studies where the uh, CPI of countries dropped after there have been um, many articles about corruption cases in the newspapers. So this makes me wonder, when we expose corruption, uh, can this also create a situation in which you contribute to a sense you know, in the wider population that everybody is corrupt? We uh, report about impunity. Does that mean that people actually have, get hopeless, that you know, nothing can be done, so why would I fight? So how important is it also to report the positive cases, every single small victory that makes people think about what can be done? Okay, thank you. Could I just have the microphone here as well? I, I, I missed out this lady here. I'd like her question too, and then we'll wrap up. Good afternoon. I'm Rites Barsha from Philippines. Uh, from a uh, journalism perspective, I want to know uh, there's a missing point uh, earlier based on the report that I noticed that there's no public journalism approach being implemented on in-depth story. And so as... Uh, for in-depth story, I didn't see that uh, they don't see the, how the government is responding or providing funds for basic services for water or sanitation, uh, which included in the platform of government of any public elected officials. The missing point I am looking at. Thank you. Okay. Um, we... I'm going to give you each of you one final go, and I hope that one of you will, will address each of those questions at least, and you're welcome to address both as well. Um, Sally, do you want to start? Oh, well, I would like to answer to the first question to bring my modest contribution. The thing is, uh, investigative journalists consist in gathering, let's say, hardcore evidence on the subject you choose to investigate. But most of the time when we choose to look at a story, it's not really very easy to find, let's say, good examples, you know, to focus or to highlight a solution-oriented story. It's not that the journalist choose at the beginning to show the bad side as you usually do or the story or what's going on the ground. We, we dig, you know, to try to bring out all the sides and you just when you have all the sides, I mean, because telling a story from only one perspective is not journalism, this is activism. So you have to make a clear difference between, you know, both. So it's not easy. In the case where you have corruption, where you go in a society where you find that, I mean, the fabric, all the fabric of the society are corrupt, and it's not easy to find good examples on where you can focus and say, this is what can be done, you know, to fix the problem. People who will read your story will think that this guy is, has already is mind oriented on one, only one aspect of the story is trying to show that you know everything is spoiling the society. That's not the case. So we we try our best to try to bring out stories and you know good examples to show that there are some people in the society who can be you know show out good example. But it's not very easy. Okay, uh, David. Okay. Your next question. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> thanks. Uh, sorry, just so I make sure I understand correctly, you're saying that that CPI said that where there's more reporting on corruption, the corruption index for that country improves? Or was it the opposite? No, the opposite. That the more you report, the more people think everything is corrupt. Okay, okay. Um, oh, I'll have to find that, track that down. Thanks for that. Uh, 
and I lost my train of thought while asking the question, what was I going to say? Okay. I think, look, I'm not working as a journalist in a, in a country or a developing country, so I think, again, the perspective of my colleagues here is a lot more valid than, than mine, but um, I think that in any sort of an issue uh, that is problematic in some way, that you don't want to push it under the rug, you want it to be exposed. And we all have our own definition of what a journalist is or a good journalist is, but I mean, for me, it's somebody who is, who is seeking the truth and the way they, they, they find the truth in as much as it can be found is, is as Sile said, talk to multiple different people, get lots of different perspectives. Um, but in the course of seeking that truth, I think journalists who are, especially working in developing countries, but not only, um, I'll explain that in a second, um, by talking to different people and by getting to that truth about corruption and water, ultimately it'll, it'll shine a light on the fact that the people who are suffering the most are the most marginalized and the vulnerable in society. They're the poorest. Um, they're the women who were mentioned in one of, the, one of the earliest presentations. So I don't think that on any sort of controversial issue, even if maybe there's some research that shows what you said shows, I don't think that we should, we should try to avoid it. And, okay, we mentioned um, developing countries, but... Uh, one thing that's interesting for me, I used to live in Sweden um, for a long time, so I come back to the Water Week, and I noticed uh, this time in coming back to visit, and maybe you've noticed as well in the central station, there are more homeless people. And I wonder, why are these homeless people, and, and where are they from? And I've, I've asked a few people, and actually some say some are actually homeless people, they're having a difficult situation. Others are being controlled by a cartel, or to use the word of the first presentation, a mafia. So if I was a journalist working in Sweden, I would want to explore that and understand, understand why that situation is occurring, not just walk by it every day and kind of turn my head the other way. Um, don't know if that really answered your question, but uh, uh, thanks. Okay. Baba Soli. I, I think my uh, two earlier colleagues have uh, sufficiently addressed the questions. Um, I think my passing message would be for us to fully comprehend and understand the meaning of corruption, especially in the water sector. Uh, because uh, from our discussion, it seems that we are more or less limiting corruption to maybe infinite of contrast. Of course, we know there's this high contrast in government circles, and contrast uh, for the award of uh, maybe chemicals, procurement, you know, uh, construction of water, water infrastructures. But corruption in the water sector goes beyond like that. Of course, there are different levels and magnitude of corruption. Um, even the consumer, for instance, that refused to pay, you know, for his water business is corrupt, you know, and that is what the Nairobi man and calls the non-revenue water. The consumer that uh, induces the the or the meter reader um, to, I mean, get a wrong reading is also corrupt. So we, we need to know all the levels of corruption. I want to refer us um, for those of us, I mean. Um, who are not aware, there is a NANMA book that was published by, I think, Transparency International um, and WIN on corruption in the water sector, which defines all the forms and categories of corruption in the water sector. I also want to say, for, I, I also as a concluding statement, that um, with uh, my association and experience in journalism, with also a sense of modesty, I want to say that we as journalists, we need to be much more knowledgeable about the, about the water sector. The water sector is a very technical sector. It's not sports where you just report the team that wins the game. You know, the, the, the water sector is very technical. You know, so we need to read a lot and understand it a lot before we can adequately and sufficiently and independently report the sector. You know, all the actors in the sector, the various, I mean, policy makers, regulators, service providers, the consumers. You know, how does the utility work? What, what are the work of a regulator? What are the work of the policy makers, the ministries and departments? I mean, all the key actors that are working, you know, uh, in an integrated manner, you know, to make the water sector works. And I, I think it's only after we have gained that very in-depth understanding of the water sector that the quality of our reporting of the sector can increase. Thank you. Stella, I think you get the last word. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Jacob um, actually mentioned uh, uh, something called the entry point. So when you are on field, what's your entry point? I think uh, a lot of times, um, if the government is your entry point, then you have to dig the public policy. Because there are public policies as much as we would like to dismiss them as non-effective or whatever. So 
the public policy, if you are missing out on that, you, I don't think you are going to do a complete job. Uh, if your entry point is the development sector, there will be a lot of pessimism a lot of times. Um, it's good, but the important thing is to not to surrender to that. Uh, and if your entry points are the community, then a lot of times I see uh, a lot of us feel tempted to go on and on with the, you know, the, the, the story of the suffering. But it's also important to stop and ask them, so what's the solution do you think would work? Because there are solutions, it's just that those solutions are not devised by the community that's suffering. Probably it's the solutions that are coming from top or it's being, it's being devised by a third party and that's not going to work. And, and that's, the, the, the result is that, that the problem persists. And you know, in this case, I'm talking about, we're talking about integrity, lack of it, and, and corruption. So I think what Slay ultimately said, that you can't just do uh, this, uh, the, the, your entire story just by talking to one or two people, no matter how credible or how good they are at their jobs. As a journalist, you have to be inclusive. You have to talk to the the, the public policy makers. You have to talk to the community that's right at the center of it, and you have to talk to the, the development sector or the NGOs, the civil societies. And somewhere in between, when you're doing or talking to all of them, I think you will find some solution. You may not have started out on an agenda, I'm going to find a very beautiful story, you know, but if you are not forgetting any of these important factors, I'm pretty sure that you will find out with somebody saying something, you know what, the problem is this big, but there is something. Uh, and I think by, by, by bringing it out, that solution in your story, you are actually giving a chance for somebody to work on it and then upscale it. Thank you. That's great. We're going to have to wrap up there. Do you, do you have anything you need to say, Jacopo? You're, you're done. I'm not going to attempt to summarize what I thought was a very rich and stimulating session. I'm sure you all have your own summaries working in your heads right now. Um, good luck. <laughs> All right. And I should have said thank you to the panelists, so thank you to the panelists. Thank you.